I'm here to talk about my book, Autumn the Gobi, My Story of China and America. The story really began when I was 12 years old. And I wrote this book because I think it is very important to understand the part of history that people of my generation lived through in order to understand China today. In general, I think that uh, it is impossible to understand a country without understanding its history. But I think the period of time during which we uh, spent time in the countryside was really the defining moment for this country, that is uh, China. Let me begin from um, the uh, 10th anniversary of the uh, founding of the People's Republic of China. Let me see if I can work with this. I, I don't know how many people know this gentleman who stands next to Mao, Chairman Mao. And the newspaper page that I show here is the front page of the People's Daily on October 1st, 1959. That was the 10th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And this gentleman portrayed side by side with Mao. And his name was Liu Shaoqi. And his title was the president of the country. So he was the co-leader, head of the state of the country. And uh, Ch Chairman Mao was chairman of the party not head of the state, and Liu Shaoqi was head of the state. A few years later, actually seven years later, this is what happened to him, Liu Shaoqi. Head of the state, he was taken out of his home in Zhunanghai by Red Guards, by rebels. He was verbally attacked. He was brutalized. He was thrown into prison without anybody knowing about it without a process at all. And three years later, he died in prison, nameless, naked, and nobody knew what happened to him. And that is what happened to a lot of people during the Cultural Revolution. Even the head of state was put into that kind of situation. His wife was 47 years old in 1966, and she was hauled by Red Guards, 300,000 of them, in Tsinghua University, into a struggle session. And she was put on the stand. And she was also attacked and brutalized, humiliated. They forced her to wear a necklace made of ping pong balls to humiliate her, to indicate that she had a preference for so-called capitalistic lifestyles. And that's why they forced her to do so. She was also put into prison for 12 years, in solitary confinement for 12 years. She survived the Cultural Revolution, luckier than her husband. But 12 years, she was in solitary confinement. And this gentleman, his name, was Peng De Huai. He was the first defense minister of China. And as you can see here, at one time, he was very close to Mao. And he was the commander in chief of the Chinese forces during the Korean War. And he led the Chinese forces to fight with the Americans, the UN forces, to a standstill, as you know, at the 38th parallel, which stands even to this day. So he made great contributions to the New People's Republic. He fought together with Mao for all these years of trying to take over power in China. In 1958, he was critical of Mao's policies of the Great Leap Forward, which eventually led to the Great Famine, as I described in my book, which between 1960 and 1962 killed 36 million people. 36 million people represented at that time 5% of the entire Chinese population perished, died of starvation because of the failed policies 
of the Great Leap Forward, which led to the Great Famine. And he was mildly critical of Mao's policies. As a result of that, he was stripped of all his positions. He was disgraced. He was put into prison. And this is what happened in 1966 when the Cultural Revolution started. The rebels, the Red Guards, took him out, totally brutalized him. And this was a marshal in the military. And he was brutalized. Eventually, he died in prison as well. And this gentleman, as some of you may read Chinese, would read his name on the plaque. He was the father of Xi Jinping. And his name is Xi Zhongxin. And he was vice premier of the country. And in 1963, he got into trouble because he supported the publication of a book which Mao considered to be a poisonous weed. And for that offense, he was also purged from all his positions. And he was put into prison. And he suffered for 18 years in confinement or otherwise sent to the countryside until 1978, when Deng Xiaoping came back to power. So Xi Jinping's father went through a very tough period of time. And I know how risky it is to write a book <laughs> if his experience is any indication. So it was a very chaotic time in 1966 when the Cultural Revolution started. Mao called upon the Red Guards to overthrow every authority in every establishment, whether in the government or in academia or in schools. And all the schools were shut down. It was the year when I was about to finish elementary school. And all of a sudden, we were told there would be no schools. Initially, I was very happy. I thought <laughs> we were going to have a very long vacation. And I didn't realize. At that time, this vacation would last for 10 years. So for the next 10 years, there will be no school. And Mao called upon the Red Guards to rise up against the establishments, not only in Beijing, but he called upon them to spread the fire of the revolution throughout the country, to go out of Beijing and go anywhere in the country to spread the fire of revolution or creating chaos throughout the country. And uh, in 1966, starting from August the 18th of that year, he reviewed Red Guards eight times in Tiananmen Square. And this is you know, one scene that you can see. He drove them into a frenzy, and they shouted all the slogans, long live Chairman Mao, long live the Cultural Revolution. And then after that, they spread out throughout the country to spread the fire of revolution. Everything was provided for, for free. Uh, transportation, you could hop onto any train, any bus, any public transport, transportation, no charge at all. Everywhere Red Guards went, they were provided with food, with lodging. So very quickly, the fire of the revolution spread throughout the country. All the governments became paralyzed. And even traffic lights became paralyzed. And the entire country descended into chaos. I was 12, and there was a big boy in our neighborhood who was 17 years old. And he decided he would organize a group of people to travel around the country to see the country in the name of this great networking. And so I followed him and some other friends to travel to many different parts of the country at that time. And this is a photograph that we took on Jingangshan, which was the first Red Army base that Mao established in 1927. And we marched just like the Red Army, and we visited all the red historical size. And I'm the second one on the right, uh, from the right, with a cane, with a city smile on my face. And uh, we were able to see many parts of the country at that particular age. 
My parents, even though I was 12, couldn't stop me because it was a time of revolution and they couldn't resist the revolution. But very soon, Red Guards turned on each other and different factions of the Red Guards wanted to show to others that they were more revolutionary, they were more loyal to Mao than the other faction. So they started to fight with each other and very quickly the fighting became very violent. And Mao eventually described the Cultural Revolution as a full-scale civil war, during which time all kinds of weapons were used, guns, rifles, uh, cannons, and even tanks. You know, I uh, gave uh, a, a talk in New York City uh, a few months ago when I was there, and uh, an old friend came to me and said, and he was a graduate of Tsinghua University, engineering student. He said, we spent a lot of time making grenades, better grenades than the military grade. And he said, I walked around Beijing with two grenades in my pockets. Uh, you know, that was how lawless and chaotic the time was. So I was able to find one picture on the web to show one of the fightings. But this is a very mild version. I saw more violent beatings, fightings, and uh, clashes between the Red Guards than this. And on the right is the artist's rendition of what happened after one of the big fights between Red Guards. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed during that period of time. Red Guards killing Red Guards. And before that, they were killing reactionaries, counter-revolutionaries, whoever they considered to be bad guys, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in that way. And then afterwards, in 19, late 1966 and early 1967, they started to kill each other. And it was so chaotic, even Mao thought that things were out of control. So he decided to uh, do something about it. And he came up, as he always did, with a brilliant idea. He decided to send all these young people to the countryside. So he said, young people need to go to the countryside to learn from the peasants, to reform their world outlook, and to transform the backward countryside into, I suppose, socialist paradise. And uh, so he sent millions of young people to the most remote, most barren, the poorest parts of China to do hard labor. I was not alone. I was sent to the Gobi Desert. I went together with uh, many of my peers. If you look at the map of China, it looks like the shape of a rooster. And Beijing is at the throat of the rooster. And if you look at the back of the rooster, in yellow color, that's the Gobi Desert. The red dotted line is the Great Wall. In ancient times, anything north of the Great Wall was not considered to be inhabitable uh, by civilized people. So the wall was built to keep the barbarians out. But the Gobi Desert is where I was sent along with many people of my generation. In that year, in 1969, I was 15 years old. And I left my home and went to the Gobi Desert. But in that year, about 16 million young people were sent to different parts of China, all remote, poorest areas of China, to do hard labor. 16 million people represented about 10% of the entire urban population of China. 10% of the entire urban population of China at that time it was about 160 million people. China was by far a agrarian society at that time. So in recent years, we have seen the most massive urbanization process in human history in China. You know, millions of people became urban dwellers. But 50 years ago, it was the reverse urbanization. I don't even have a word for it. It's, it's not rural, <laughs> ruralization, but it was reverse urbanization. So many young people were sent to the countryside. And this is 
the, uh, a picture of the Gobi Desert where I was sent. And that was a photograph of myself right before I went to the Gobi at the age of 15. And the terrain looked like this today. And it looked exactly like this 50 years ago. And in six years, we did hard labor on that piece of land. Our job was to transform this land into fertile farmland. Our job was to grow crops. And you can imagine how successful we were trying to do the work. I can assure you that land looks exactly the same today as it was 50 years ago. But during that period of time, we worked extremely hard without much to eat, without enough to clothe ourselves, and very often without even a shelter. And here's another pho photograph of myself chasing a bull in the Gobi. It gives you some idea of the terrain over there. I discovered when I was there, if you see a bull, if you charge the bull, the bull will run away. And if you try to run away, he will come after you. And I, I, you know, I look at this Spanish bullfight. I said, you know, this is all you know, made up because uh, just charge the bull. And then he will run away. Uh, my uh, publisher, in fact, took this picture, doctored it, and turned it into the cover of the book. They took away the bull mysteriously, and they turned the direction around so that I don't run into the spine of the book. I'm actually running out of the Gobi. But when we first got there, the Gobi Desert, in fact, the weather here somewhat reminds me of the Gobi <laughs> Desert, but uh, it is much um, uh, more severe, and, and here is much more pleasant. And the Gobi Desert in wintertime is extremely cold. You know, there's no Pacific Ocean, of course, extremely cold. Typically, the temperature uh, could drop to minus 10 or even 20 Fahrenheit. And in that kind of temperature, it's extremely difficult to uh, survive uh, in the open for very long. But when we first got there, there was no housing at all. So we had to dig holes in the ground to spend the night. And I remember in October, it was already quite cold in the Gobi, and the temperature was certainly below the freezing point. And we had to spend a lot of time digging holes and then spend the night in the hole, shivering throughout the night, hoping for the dawn to come. And eventually, we were able to build some uh, shelters by ourselves. And here's another picture of myself with a friend. I'm on the right. In front of the shelters that we built, the huts we built for ourselves, and gives you an idea of the kind of housing that we had in the Gobi. And uh, in wintertime, uh, I can tell you that uh, the temperature inside and out was exactly the same because there was no heating, there was no fuel. And the only source of fuel was cow manure, the cow dung, which we would spend hours scavenging in the Gobi, collecting cow manure. When dried, you can burn them, and they don't smell so bad. You can burn them for five, six minutes. Every night before bedtime, we would build a little bonfire and that will give us enough warmth to enable us to remove our clothes, to get under the cover. Without that warmth, it will be exceedingly difficult to remove even one piece of your clothes. Your whole body was frozen. And to this day, I, whenever I see a fireplace, I feel you know, very uh, comfortable uh, by, by the warmth, because I remember that little fire that gave the warmth it gave to us uh, at that time. When I first came to this country, by the way, I noticed when people don't agree with you, they say, bullshit. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, that thing used to be very dear to me. <laughs> <laughs> in wintertime, in northern part of China, peasants typically take a break because the land is frozen, crops are in, 
there's not much to do. So for two to three months, people just stay inside. We were not so lucky. We were organized as almost a military, even though we were not part of the military. Our commanders were military officers. So we had to obey orders. And we were ordered every winter to march miles and miles to a frozen lake to cut reeds. Reeds grow on the lake in summertime. In wintertime, the lake is completely frozen, so solid that you can run tractors and trucks. We didn't have trucks. We did have tractors on the lake. So we were ordered to go to the lake to cut reeds every winter and sleeping, working, eating on the frozen lake. And this is a photograph of myself cutting reeds on the lake using this crude instrument with iron blade in front of it. And you will have to use all your bodily strength to push this thing forward to cut the reeds down. We were given a quarter of half metric ton per person per day. That's 1,000 pounds, dried reeds. Before we could finish or fulfill our quarter, we couldn't break, couldn't have a meal. And we were given two meals a day. The first one was 8 o'clock in the morning. There was never enough to eat. The next one would not come until about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon after we finished some work. And typically by 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon, I would feel so hungry. My stomach was completely empty. My body was so cold that I would feel chilled out from inside and out because you don't have any energy left in you working so hard in, uh, on the frozen lake uh, in the middle of the Gobi. So that's the type of work that we did day in, day out, half time every day. We typically work in a group of three. So each group will have to, each little team will have to produce 3,000 pounds of dried reeds every day. And then we have to bundle them, stack them up, and put them onto a nice sledge. And then we pull the sledge to a paper mill, a pulp mill, about 50 miles away, one way, and then come back before we could have dinner. And we did that every year, every winter, every day in the winter for about six years. We were working hard without much to eat on a frozen lake every winter. And the harder part was that uh, there was no water. We were working on the lake. We stood on millions of gallons of water, and yet there was no water to drink because the lake was frozen solid, to get to the water was impossible. You, know, you have to spend hours and hours to dig a hole. It's like uh, drilling uh, a concrete uh, uh, road uh, to reach uh, deep uh, into um, underneath to get water. So what we did was we would dig out some ice, and we would quench our thirst by sucking on the ice. When the temperature was minus 10 Fahrenheit, I can tell you that to quench your thirst by sucking on a piece of ice is almost impossible. Your, your hands, your body, your mouth, uh, everything was totally frozen. And if you put ice in your mouth, you felt that everything was frozen uh, in your face. And what I did was to put a few pieces of ice in my pocket. They would not melt. Uh, because the temperature was so low, I would take it out from time to time as I was working to suck on it. So very little water and uh, very uh, hard work and uh, very little food. So that's how we spent days and days, weeks and weeks, and uh, months and months uh, doing hard labor in the Gobi. All kinds of works, digging canals, uh, working in the fields, of uh, cutting reeds, and uh, you know, we did this for about six years. But I would say that the hardest part, as far as I was concerned, was that there was no education. You know, I was out of school at the age of 12, and for the next 10 years, there was no schooling. All the books were banned. Even books available before the Cultural Revolution 
were banned during the Cultural Revolution. And reading was frowned upon. I got into trouble uh, for being caught reading. And uh, so most people simply didn't read, and they just wasted all their time uh, day in, day out uh, in the Gobi. And uh, my biggest regret uh, in my life is that I have so many friends who are so talented, but their lives were completely wasted by the Cultural Revolution. I show you this photograph of a friend, Liu Xiaotong, who is holding this violin uh, together with me. This guy is so talented. He picks up any musical instrument, like a violin, like an accordion, uh, accordion like uh, arhu, uh, anything he picks up, without anybody teaching him, he'll be able to play it beautifully after a few weeks. And he's that talented. And he knew to play all kinds of musical instruments. And he played as well as the music that we hear from radio from time to time. He's a great artist. He paints. And uh, he, uh, he's a photographer. He has a little crude camera that uh, he took pictures with. All the pictures that I show you here were taken by him at that time. He developed them using devices that he created by himself. He printed the photographs with candlelight uh, by himself. He no longer had these pictures, but I kept uh, some of the, uh, the, the pictures. So he was multi-talented. And without the Cultural Revolution, I'm sure he would have become one of the most accomplished artists in China. But the Cultural Revolution completely wasted him. You know, he never were able to receive an education. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, he was able to finally get out of the Gobi, but he was not able to find a decent job. Because without any knowledge, without any training, without any formal education in the new society, it's difficult for many of my friends to find a decent job. So many of my friends from the Gobi days still live at the bottom of the society in dire poverty to this day, because they were deprived of education. How he got out of the Gobi was quite interesting. He was so talented, he also knew how to carve seals and chops, you know, the Chinese chops. So he told me that eventually he uh, carved the official chop on the sole of his plastic, uh, <laughs> the plastic sole of his shoes. And uh, using that chop, he certified he was too sick to stay in the Gobi. <laughs> he was able to get out of the Gobi and go back to Beijing. But otherwise, he was never able to catch up uh, uh, with his education. We were young. We were 15, 16 years old when we first went over there. There were older folks who also did hard labor, exiled to the Gobi. And this gentleman, his name is Yi Kong. And he has a very interesting background. He was trained in the United States, in the Air Force, during the war. He was a member of the Air Force of the old regime of China, Kuomintang government. And uh, during the war, America and China were allies with each other. So they sent him to America to be trained in the Air Force. So he was trained as a fighter pilot, but he also served in the US Navy, traveling around on, he told me, a cruise ship. I don't know if it's aircraft or cruise ship, but in Chinese, it sounded like a cruise ship. So he flew bombers, he flew fighters, and he flew civilian airlines as well in the old China. But in 1949, in January of 1949, he and his comrades decided to desert uh, from the Kuomintang uh, military to the communists in Beijing. So they flew 12 hours, uh, 12 aircraft from Hong Kong all the way to Beijing. And those 12 aircraft laid the foundation for China's civilization 
industry, a aviation industry today, civil aviation industry today. So he made a great contribution to New China as well. But because of his history, you know, being trained in America and all that, you can imagine during the Cultural Revolution, he was in trouble. So he was exiled to the Gobi to do hard labor together with us. I became a very close friend of his because he went to the Gobi without a single copy of a book. And I had in my possession a few books and I shared with him in secret and he was very grateful to me for sharing those books uh, with him. So he would tell me about things in the United States and I still remember how shocked I was when he told me that uh, the United States in 1940s when he was here was richer than China in 1970s because I grew up believing that China was uh, one of the most pr prosperous uh, socialist countries in the world. And I was always sympathetic for the uh, oppressed people in capitalist societies. But he told me that uh, the oppressed people actually live much better than we did. <laughs> and I lost my sympathy for the oppressed people. <laughs> and I still have not regained that sympathy to this day. But he spent uh, uh, five, six years with us. Eventually, he uh, retired to uh, uh, his hometown uh, many years ago. When my secretary was helping me put the photographs together, she looked at this picture. She said, which one is you? <laughs> <laughs> I realized I have come to his age as well. All these things came to an end in 1976 when Mao died and uh, the Cultural Revolution came to an end. Uh, I went back to Beijing to get enrolled in the college. And in 1979, China opened up, established diplomatic relationship with the United States. And this year is the 40th anniversary of that relationship, formal diplomatic relationship under Jimmy Carter, of course, Nixon, Richard Nixon paved the way. And in 1978, Deng came back to power. And Deng and his comrades looked at the Cultural Revolution and during which he was sent to Jiangxi province to become a worker in the factory, in the tractor factory. And uh, he suffered through that period of time as well. I think it re reflected upon the experience of China under socialist economic system and decided that the old system under which all economic activities were controlled by the state didn't produce prosperity for the country. It produced only poverty, dire poverty. In fact, we couldn't even produce enough to feed ourselves. And they decided to save China. They had to go down a different path and they decided to move in the direction of the market economy. So the policy that Deng and the people around him adopted was a policy of economic reforms, meaning market economy, and open door, which really laid the foundation for the establishment of diplomatic relationship with the United States and some other countries. And I was able, because of that new policy, I was able in 1980, five years after I got out of the Gobi to come to the United States to become a visiting scholar to study. Actually, when I first came, I was labeled as visiting scholar. Nobody knew that I had never been to middle school at all, <laughs> uh, nor did I have any formal education. Uh, but Americans knew so little about Red China at the time, nobody questioned my credentials. <laughs> and uh, this is a photograph somebody uh, sent to me right before my book went to print of me arriving in San Francisco chatting with uh, Diane Feinstein, who was mayor of San Francisco. And uh, that was my first stop uh, in the United States. And uh, I began my formal education in that particular year. And about two years later, I got into Berkeley's PhD program. And my academic advisor was 
Jenny Yellen, the former Fed chair, and she very kindly wrote a foreword for the book. So you should get a copy of the book. If you don't read my content, uh, you can read her foreword, <laughs> which <laughs> is also quite rare. Among other things, she said, he had arrived at Berkeley to start his PhD program, and I was his academic advisor. I was stunned to discover that he had no formal math training. All the math he knew he had learned by himself by candlelight. And by then, it was too late. They didn't kick me out. <laughs> and, and eventually, I was able to get my PhD at UC Berkeley, and then uh, I became a professor at the Wharton School um, for about six years. Uh, and then after that, I went to Hong Kong to become a banker and investor. I'm happy to report that uh, my book is doing pretty well. I was told that Amazon only put their best best-selling books into their physical stores. So uh, somebody sent me a photograph of my book in their physical store uh, like this. And when I look at this photograph, I'm not quite sure about the company I keep. <laughs> but it appears that somebody has had even tougher life than I did. <laughs> In any case, that is my story. Actually, it's the teaser of my story, and the story is in the book. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>